So without any further ado, I would like to um, invite our uh, last speaker, uh, which is uh, Frank Benwell. Uh, Frank, thank you very much for, for being here with us. Uh, I will say a couple of words uh, about you, a short introduction, and then, we'll, then I will give you the floor. Um, we will have 30 minutes presentation and then about roughly uh, 15 minutes for Q&As. Uh, so, uh, Frank Benwell started arboriculture and utility arboriculture in 1975 in Canada, being involved in both fields in the years since. He emigrated to New Zealand in uh, 1984 and worked in governmental agencies, but mostly in private enterprise, and spent intermittent period in other locations such as Australia, California, training in China, and also as a consultant to the Hawaiian Electric Company. 20 years earlier, as an arborist climber and equipment operator, he progressed to project management, training, safety, and consulting positions in those locations. Uh, after almost three, almost three years uh, in Romania, where he provided arboricultural and training services, he returned to Canada, first working as a consulting arborist and then as a utility arborist for electric, electric utilities, sorry for that. Uh, he has great interest, experience, and skills in both arboriculture and utility arboriculture. So without any further ado, uh, thank you for taking part in this event and in this panel. And we invite you to be with us for, uh, to, 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 to have your presentation. Uh, and now I give you the floor. Thank you very much. Thank you. <clears throat> thank you very much, Alex. Uh, can, can you hear me all right? Yes. Okay, great. I'm glad technology is working for me. I had a power outage here this morning. I almost was not able to uh, to be present, so I'm, I'm glad everything's worked out. Um, please forgive my Romanian, but bună ziua, and for me, bună dimineața. Vă mulțumesc pentru această oportunitate de a vorbi astăzi. How bad was that? It was great. Mulțumim foarte mult. <laughs> I had to practice. It's been a, it's been a long time. Um, I'd like to thank uh, Aesop for inviting me to uh, to present today, and I'd particularly like to to, to thank uh, Andre for his uh, his effort. Um, it's a uh, it's an opportunity. I'm really happy to have. I'm glad to be back in Romania, even if it's only uh, only virtually. As Alex mentioned, I'm an arborist and a uh, utility arborist, but I like to think of myself as uh, somebody who has a practical focus on where trees should be, where they shouldn't be, what needs to be done to protect trees, how to integrate uh, the urban forest into infrastructure in the urban environment, or vice versa, how to integrate uh, urban uh, infrastructure into the urban forest. I'm, I'm going to explain a few basics about trees just so that there's an understanding regarding what needs to be protected and how it needs to be protected. So with, um, I'm going to apologize in advance. I have some sad stories about trees uh, in Romania. Um, this first picture here is in Brasov at the zoo. And I'll come back to this picture. I just want this picture at the beginning of my presentation, but I will come back to this. This is the table of contents of a, 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 a report I provided to the city of Timisoara when I lived in uh, Romania. And uh, it was an effort to provide the city with uh, information on their program, their trees, their contractors, the practices. Uh, I don't, to tell you the honest truth, know what happened with the report, but uh, I left just after uh, after providing it. But it gave me an opportunity to learn a lot about uh, not just uh, trees in Timisoara. I had lived in Brasho before that, but it uh, it gave me an overall picture of of uh, how how trees are treated in uh, Romania. This I'm going to give you this example here as an introduction. The Turner Oak in Kew Gardens, it's uh, roughly 200 years old. It, uh, it uh, was in declining health up until they had their major storm 
in the south of England in 1987. The southeast of England lost uh, 15 million trees. Kew Gardens lost 700 trees. Uh, this tree here was lifted out of the ground by the storm and tilted sideways. And Kew Gardens seriously considered uh, cutting it down and, and throwing it away. But they used uh, winches, moved it back into the ground and then propped it up to, uh, to just see if it would survive. And then they carried on removing the uh, other damage in the park. And uh, the plan was to come back and look at this tree and decide whether they should keep it or not. What they found was when they came back in roughly 1990 and look, took a good hard look at it was that it was healthier after three years after the storm than it was prior to the storm. And the reason for that is they realized there were decades of thousands of footsteps, pedestrian traffic over top of the root zone that compacted the soil and, and inhibited the, the tree's ability to, to gain nutrients and, uh, and water. So that was a, a recognition of soil compaction at that point, not just for that tree, but they realized that all their trees in Kew Gardens were suffering the, the same problem. And more than that, it was a turning point uh, in the early 90s in arboriculture in general, where worldwide, the effects of uh, soil compaction were starting to be recognized. So it was, a, it was, it was important. And what they found was, what they have found is that now the tree has gained 30% more foliage than it had prior to the storm. So they mulched it and they had a barrier up. Those things permitted the tree to recover. Well, they permitted the soil to recover first and then the roots to recover. That the tree will never be as healthy as it would have been if there's no soil compaction, but it's, uh, it's recovered and it's improving. There's misconceptions about where roots grow. People think trees grow, grow roots straight down to China. The thing is that, that there's a, a, a root plate that can be likened to the base of a, of a, a wine glass. They, this, this comparison was provided by Kew Gardens. But the important thing is that the absorbing roots of a tree are in the top 30 to 45 centimeters of, of the soil, and they go right up to the surface. This is the most important thing because what I saw in Romania, well, it happens everywhere. People think trees grow roots straight down to China, and then they have no problem with scouring out the earth where they think there's no roots. The problem is that's where the absorbing roots are. This is an example of, of what soil compaction does. On the right, you can see that soil compaction has reduced the growth of the, the roots. The roots don't grow. They, they aren't able to provide the tree with the nutrients and water that they need. And so the tree is weak. All it takes is uh, constant pedestrian traffic, although vehicle traffic is worse. This is just a little bit of an explanation of the importance of acknowledging the fact that a tree has to have access to water and minerals, nutrients, uh, to create its own food through photosynthesis. Basically what a tree does is it feeds itself. It makes new food, it uses that food, and it stores that food. If the roots are damaged, it can't create new food. So all it does is it's, it's as if with a human being, we couldn't go to the market anymore and we had to live off the food in our, our, our cupboard. Once the food in the cupboard is gone, we die. And that's the same with the tree. So it's very important. The root zone is critical. With urban development, you have new sidewalks, new underground, new pipelines, new overhead wires, new sidewalks, new curbs, new houses. All of that is going to affect um, the roots of established trees. If we, if the tree's not significant, we don't worry about it. If it is, we need to worry about it. This is uh, Park Kopilor in, uh, in Timisoara. The picture on the right is uh, a picture I took in 
2010. And that tree still has, uh, you know, I've, I've enlarged that picture to confirm it, but there's, there's live buds on it and uh, it, it would come out in, in green leaf, although it's not as healthy as uh, it had been originally. The picture on the left is now, that tree is dead. I doubt there's a single green bud on it. The issue with these trees is there was damage done to these roots probably in the 1980s uh, when they, they uh, introduced some infrastructure. And that picture in the, on the right of 2010, that, that reflects that damage and that recovery. And then the new project in uh, Timisoara with the new footpaths in it was probably 2012, um, 2011 maybe, uh, in the, uh, the uh, playground area. That finished the trees off. With, with this project, with a little bit of uh, maybe changes with the project, um, these trees could have been saved. The biggest problem was, I know what happened, I saw it myself when I was there. The contractors came in, they have no knowledge of trees. They came in with equipment, they tore everything up and destroyed all the roots, built their project, put in new soil, new grass. It looks pretty, but the trees start to decline. You have to excuse this diagram. It's just something rough I put together to start to identify the trees. But this is um, Google Earth. Uh, overview in uh, 2012. And it shows green foliage on these trees, but it was after the construction. This is, this is also after the construction, but it's in 2020. So why do we have green leaves here, but not here? Well, that's because this is the first year or two after the construction. The trees are living off their um, photosynthetes, the stored food. And nobody, nobody notices. They think, well, we built the project, we have green grass, the trees are healthy. That's fine. The second year, maybe the same thing. Third year, only an arborist would start to notice the change. After that, after that, we get to this. So what I'm emphasizing is the, the, the need to prevent the damage in the first place. This is the uh, zoo in Brasov. And... Uh, you can see uh, down at the base here how they've carved out all the root zone. The root zone is destroyed. I doubt this tree will survive. And then my note on the right refers to, uh, I was in this zoo 10 years ago and there's a lot of erosion damage to the roots of trees there. And I'm wondering, you know, what kind of project they have in the zoo now and what sort of damage is gonna be done as in uh, the children's park. This is the same tree. The picture on the left is one I took 10 years ago. And it's not much different from the one on the right, which is fairly recent. But the tree on the left, the picture on the left in the winter, it, it, it's not what the tree was originally. These trees, as with the children's park, were probably planted as far back as the 1880s. They're heritage trees. There's a lot of damage done with the original construction of the zoo. But now the roots are destroyed. That tree now with the green leaves, it's struggling to survive. It's throwing out extra growth down low. But gradually that tree will decline seriously. I don't think it will survive. And the ironic thing is that the stra strata is a strata stage The street is named after that tree. So Soon that tree will be gone and, and uh, the street will still be named Oak Street. Great change is a serious problem with, uh, with uh, established trees. Either you raise it or you lower it, you're, you're damaging how that tree feeds itself. If you lower the, the great change, you might be damaging the drainage. It might not be getting proper water. If you increase the great change, as has been done here, at the uh, new lake in Brasov. I think what they did, they dredged uh, soil to make the lake and then piled it around this established group of trees. And what happens there, it's the same as soil compaction because the, the roots that are established die. 
And also what happens is the, the trunk of the tree is covered. The, the, tree can't, the tree has to be able to breathe through the bark through what are called lenticels. So that smothering takes place, plus you get a decay on the uh, live tissue underneath the bark. This is uh, Timmy Schwana again. This is an example of, you know, if the, the project can be changed, move the footpath over a little bit, then you don't have to chop out hooks of root like, like, like I found. This is just one piece of two pieces of the root that I found. It's a major root. How is that going to affect the tree? How is that going to affect the stability of the tree? Is it going to fall over? Is it going to die? Is it going to be a public safety hazard? I think that easily that, that footpath could have been changed. Here again in uh, Timishwara, I mean, uh, the worker doesn't know any better. He's been told to get in there with a rototiller, but all the, the roots have been rototilled up and exposed or torn off. So if you do that much damage to the roots, of, excuse me, the root zone of a tree, really, how can it, how can it feed itself? It can't. So if it survives, it's going to be surviving on reduced growth and, and maybe, maybe uh, uh, ill health. Uh, and then you've got an aesthetic issue where you get dead tops. This is again in Timishwara. I don't understand why, why, <clears throat> excuse me, why someone would do that to a, to a, a beautiful part. Aside from the fact that it's damaged the aesthetics, but it's damaged the root zones of these uh, these trees. Soil compaction can be repaired, and it, and it certainly can be prevented. The best thing is prevented because, as with the Kew Gardens uh, Turner Oak, uh, the repairing only goes so far. It will never return it to the health that the tree would have been if there was no soil compaction. But the, the repairing is better than nothing because then you can retain the tree. Uh, with this tree here in the picture, I personally would have a wider area of mulch, but, but the, the mulching is so important for so many reasons. It protects the soil from the compaction. If somebody walks on it, it's not going to compact. It holds soil moisture and it restores the soil structure. So you've got air spaces, which are essential to. Uh, Roots have to have a gaseous exchange, and plus those uh, those air spaces fill up uh, alternately with water and air. Compacted soil doesn't have the air spaces. Root zone construction it, it can't be repaired. Once you damage the roots, that's it. You have to decide prior whether you should remove the tree or wait until it dies, which it will do. Um, Root zone construction can only be uh, prevented with barriers, mulch, both are a great idea. Adapting the construction plan, does the construction plan have to come that close to the tree? And then the contractual protection clause with the contractors. And I'll get to that at last, last aspect in, in just a moment. Um, this is the kind of protection you, that you, you want to establish to prevent the damage to the root zone in construction. The critical root zone is the most important, but you have to remember that roots extend far beyond that, depending on drainage, the type of soil, and the needs of the, of the, the tree. So the critical root zone is the absolute minimum, but it's a, it's a case of more is better if you want to retain the tree. This is a tree that <clears throat> Andre sent me just yesterday. Beautiful reconstruction of the uh, piazza. I remember how it was uh, before. The, uh, the uh, brickwork is terrific. The design is really impressive. <clears throat> but this tree here, it was in bad health. <clears throat> Excuse me. It was in bad health prior to um, the construction. And I looked at Google Earth. And you can see the extent to which the uh, square was torn up. But really, if the tree's unhealthy, it doesn't have much to provide in terms of aesthetics. It um, is going to die no matter what. 
especially now that there's no possibility that the roots, <clears throat> excuse me, the root zone has much integrity after the construction. Perhaps that's where you want to decide to just remove the tree in the very beginning uh, and not wait until it's a public safety hazard. And with the trees in Timishwara, uh, in, I'm sorry, in the, the children's park, to be perfectly honest, they should have been re removed completely a long time ago. They're a, they're a public safety hazard. So sometimes if it's a, if, if it's a heritage tree, if it's notable, uh, it's really important to, 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 to save these trees. If it's not a heritage tree, if it has no chance of living, then a hard decision has to be made. And me personally, I think that here it would be a perfect spot for uh, Columnar, Estar, or Stajar, rather than, than this uh, ugly thing. Um, getting back to the protection clause, I recently worked for electric utility. We we're building a new power line, transmission line on municipal land. Some uh, municipal trees had to be removed. Some were going to be retained. We made a commitment in, in writing to put up barriers and protect the trees that were to be retained. And um, we were going to meet with the municipality, get their approval for the barriers and monitor the barriers and the contractor. Plus we had written into the contract with the construction uh, contractor a uh, requirement to to respect that barrier and hold them responsible if there's damage to those trees. So unless the contractors have something like that, some sort of penalty uh, hanging over them, they'll show the roots of, uh, of established trees uh, no respect. They don't know any better, but it's, I guess, like Tibor was saying, and I was really impressed with what Tibor was saying about communicate, communicating and, uh, and facilitating the change it's a matter of educating the contractors and getting them to understand that uh, that if you destroy the roots, you lost your trees. So I said that this is a, a sad story. This next picture here, my friend Vicky found this on Facebook for me and I've blown it up. I could see the bridge through the trees and I've, I've gone through and looked at my past photos and I, I'm, I'm almost completely sure that these are the same trees that, that are in the children's park. So in 1979, before the first damage was done, and long before the most recent damage was done, these trees were the, uh, they, were, they were healthy. This is 40 years ago. Uh, can we imagine what they'd be like now? They'd still be, be they'd be larger, they'd be greener and they'd be providing uh, these aesthetics to the park. And they'd be in existence for many more decades. I, I know that this story is, my presentation is a sad story. And I, I apologize for that, but the fact is that the sad story, I mean, it breaks my heart that these trees are like that now and will have to be removed. But it's a perfect example of what needs to be done to protect trees in, in heritage trees, established trees, significant trees, trees that, that people want to retain is happening. With uh, the development in Romania, with every time a church or a basilica or a, a castle or, or whatever is, is renovated to retain it or, or a piazza, trees are getting damaged throughout the country. And, and it's, uh, it's, as an arborist, it's, it's disturbing. Um, there's a way to protect these trees. There's a way to introduce urban infrastructure to the environment, to the, to the, to the urban environment so that, that the urban forest that exists can be respected and the urban forest in general can be developed. But it takes uh, a lot of uh, interaction and communication just as uh, Tiber was uh, was describing, and I think that's my last query. <laughs> Thank you very much. Um, I think my watch is perfect because all of you three, um, all our three special guests, all finished right on the same time. So I thank you very much for that. Um, 
Well, I think it was a very interesting and very important presentation. Um, it was a sad story, but I think it's a story that has to be told. And I think that everyone should be aware of the problems we're facing right now in Romania. And I think it's not only Romania that ha is, that is facing such problems, but we are in, in all major cities and not all, all uh, and not only major, but most cities are facing these problems with the trees. And I think both the public administration and uh, the community should understand what are the problems that uh, these trees are facing, facing and how we should deal with them, heritage or not. So I want to personally thank you for uh, this very important presentation. Although it was sad, I think it was very important and it's a lesson to be learned. Um, we already started to receive questions and I would start with, uh, put them to you. Uh, the first one is, in Romania, we don't have a study program in order to prepare arborists. Um, what length uh, should a study program have to have in order to prepare proper specialists that tackle problems such as the ones you have described? Well, I'm the past president for the uh, Romanian Arboriculture Association. But when I was there, it, we, we established it and, and nothing developed. Now, Alexandru and, uh, and Stefan, they've, they've revived it. And uh, that's a great beginning. But really, right now, there is only one competent uh, tree contractor or, or more cultural contractor, and that's Stefan's, uh, Stefan Nika's business. And then after that, there's just a handful of independents who are competent, all of these fellas got their experience in in uh, Western Europe. Stefan worked eight years in, in, in the United Kingdom. As far as a program goes, when I first went to New Zealand in 1984, there was no program. I was one of six competent tree climbers and the other five had been trained in Britain. Now there's two or three arboricultural schools that train, train the arborists. And there's uh, many contractors that do their own training. I worked for a contractor and I helped with the uh, training there. Um, there's, there's things like uh, the International Society of Arboriculture. There's the uh, certified arborist. Uh, I was one, my certification has elapsed. That certification is excellent because it, it gives you all aspects of arboriculture, but it also, especially in this case, uh, describes uh, tree biology and roots and how a tree functions. And that's, that's you know, pertaining to my presentation, that the tree biology, understanding how a tree grows, how it feeds itself, where the roots are, that's so important. So to answer the question, Romania has a long ways to go, but there are courses and programs and, uh, and resources. And as, as far as that goes, I've made a commitment to always be a resource to... Uh, to remain in our whole culture. So it, it, it's going to take a concerted effort to improve, but it, it, there needs to be a beginning. But the ISA uh, Arbor certification is a, is a wonderful beginning. Well, I, th I think you're very, very right. Um, the Romanian Arboricultural uh, Association is uh, a first step to be taken. Um, and if I'm not mistaken, um, I think so far in Romania, we only have two certified uh, specialists, which are Alexandru Purcaru and uh, Stefan Nika. Hopefully there will, will be much more, many more uh, specialized certified arborists to help protect uh, the trees we already have and to properly maintain those we are willing to, to plant in the future. Um, the first question related to uh, study program for um, arborists. Um, there are actually very few or to none uh, courses to uh, train specialists in different areas. There is nothing actually in garden restoration. So we are lacking very many, uh, quite many um, such programs, hopefully uh, along with um, having more specialists in arboriculture, we will have more in different areas that have to deal with cultural landscapes in, in general and to, to trees as well. Um, but talking about heritage, in Romania, there are three trees 
which are actually listed as, as historic monuments. Um, they are not as spectacular as uh, the Turner Oak in Kew Gardens, but they have cultural values that have to be protected. Protected. However, there are no records of legislation or procedures on how to maintain these heritage trees. How should how should a legal document for intervention on this kind of trees be made? What what do you think should this kind of document contain? Well, from my experience, especially in uh, in Britain and in New Zealand, they have uh, tree protection legislation. And then individual uh, municipalities, and this is the case in Canada and the United States too, individual municipalities have their tree protection legislation uh, in place. Now, the one thing I'll say about tree protection uh, legislation, and they're called TPOs, tree protection orders, uh, that are placed on particular trees. The one problem I have with them, I've seen it in Canada and especially in New Zealand, where TPOs are put on trees that they shouldn't be put on trees because the trees aren't significant and uh, certain infrastructure has to happen. Uh, that being said, I'd have to look into two examples of it, but there, there has to be, in the legislation, there has to be firm guidelines and rules on what can be protected and what can't. If it's a heritage tree or a significant tree, it's pretty easy to put that in place. And I, I can I can provide more information on that if I do some more research. But um, you have to have the, with everything that we're discussing today, you have to have, like Tibor was saying, the, the political will is so important. Without the political will, you can't get the legislation in place. You won't have the trees protected. You won't have the contractors protecting the, 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 the trees. But if, you're able to get legislation put in place. It needs to be balanced so that it doesn't get silly where trees that shouldn't be protected are protected. And that just undermines the credibility of the, the uh, legislation. Yes, I, I totally agree. Um, I have a question that I think um, is also available for Romania, although we kind of know the, the answer to that, but also to Canada. Uh, the question is, is the arborist profession required by law when building permissions are granted? And are existing trees assessed and protected beforehand? If, if the, the municipality has that legislation in place, yes. If it doesn't, then definitely not. Okay. Um, I just received another question. Um, in 2010, uh, you, ha you, you have some courses for pruning uh, trees. Do you have anything, uh, in, and that was in Timisoara. Um, do you want to comment something about that? Do you want to tell us about your experience in Timisoara in 2020, uh, 2010 when you you had this course? Yeah, yeah, no, I, I remember those courses very well. Um, <clears throat> they were all, <clears throat> excuse me, basic. All of, you know, whether it was pruning or you know, explaining root structure or epicormic response to pruning. It was all very, very new to everybody, even with, um, even with people who had, you know, related uh, degrees. And then the, 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 with the workers, the, the pruning that, that I advised on was, was new. It was very rudimentary because, because the arboricultural knowledge and the tree biology uh, knowledge and the pruning experience didn't exist. You know, uh, I enjoyed doing it, but uh, there was, let's just say there was a lot of work to do. Well, we hope you'll be again soon in Romania and have more and do more courses. I think uh, everyone is interested in that. And we already have two specialists now in Romania with you three and many more to, to come to, to teach about how to deal with trees. So that's, I think that's an open invitation. Um, what, what do you think about the term, the term toilettare, which is more or less like beautification uh, that is, uh, we use to describe uh, very severe pruning. Uh, you, you know so many examples already. Um, the term is insinuating that we are making trees more beautiful and clean, 
but the interventions are destroying the trees from Romanian cities. Are, are you talking about very, very heavy pruning? Yes. Okay. Um, I saw in Turkey, in Bulgaria, in, in Romania, all the same sort of, you know, every three or four years, the contractor comes in who knows nothing about trees and destroys the top two thirds of a tree. So you have uh, seven or eight pegs sticking up in the air and then the tree suckers out again and becomes full. There's, we, we call that tree topping. And in North America, basically any arborist who tops a tree is lined up against the wall and shot. <sighs> There's, there's, there's tree polearding, which is common in Europe, and, and there's so many different, uh, different types of tree polearding that are absolutely beautiful. I wish it was done more in North America. And then there's aesthetic pruning to maintain the, the, the full form of a tree. I have difficulty with, with the topping off of the trees. It, it's, it's brutal. I, I, I would prefer that, that arboriculture in Romania got into to polarding, you know, every one or two or three years, the trees are polarded to the same point, the tree adapts to it. So you have the same, same root size and the same response and the tree's healthy. With destroying the top two thirds of a tree, you put the tree under serious distress. And that's when it's going to start using up all its stored food, it's photosynthates. And it may live and it may not. No, I, I saw a lot of tilia that were topped off in uh, Brasov and they recovered, but really how many times are they going to be able to recover? Relating to your answer, we have a comment and a question, uh, which is uh, lots of trees used on sidewalks walks are pruned annually using polarding technique as a role not to interfere with the electrical cables. But this generates dense head um, of foliage and branches and in time, the loss of the tree. Uh, the question is, uh, where is appropriate to use this technique on trees? Okay, polarding under the, under power lines is a bad thing to do because you get you get a, a mass of epicormic growth responding and growing straight back into the power lines. In uh, North America, we we use directional pruning to we'll have a, a V where the power lines can go through the the tree or if the tree's off to the side, we side prune it and directional prune it to direction, to, to uh, terminal buds. But it depends on the tree species. Some tree species just, I mean, you don't want a poplar tree underneath power lines because it grows too fast. It's, it's a soft, uh, sh short growing to wood, it's unstable and it will always sucker quickly right back into the power lines. But certain species, I mean, under power lines, the best thing to do is plant small trees that won't grow up into the power lines. If you want larger trees, then you have to accept that you've got the expense of directional pruning. But polarding underneath the tree is the wrong thing to do because you, all you do is get sudden growth straight back into power lines. Thank you. Thank you for, for, for your answer. Uh, we have another um, um, Another one, a comment and an answer, uh, and the question, uh, which is, thank you so much for choosing the case of Parkul Kopilor from Timisoara, one of the best ensembles of trees from the entire town. It's so sad for me when I go there to see vegetation, to see the vegetation degrading uh, and old, old trees dying. Um, I'm sorry, I did not find a, a question here, but I think the, the, the comment is quite interesting. Uh, already people are um, are unhappy to see this uh, um, this procedure this this very bad uh, procedure going on uh, and on and on in all cities in Romania for quite some time now um, if I could just could I just mention one thing with that it's important that uh, that comment is terrific I, I'm really glad to hear that the important thing is that people now realize that it was human intervention two times in the 1980s and then recently that killed those trees. It, 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 uh, the problem is that the trees dry, die gradually. So people think, well, all the trees just died. But if people know why they died, then, then it, 
it'll help people understand what we need to do. Um, in your profession, in your experience, uh, have you ever dealt with um, interventions, uh, restoration interventions in historic gardens or in cultural landscapes? And was it a project, um, a, this, this kind of project, much different to any other ones? Yes, I have. And uh, again, it depends on where it, who's involved. If you have people, you know, you'll have people that are semi-interested and semi-committed to the protection or people that are completely protected, uh, completely committed. If they're, they're completely committed, then it's, it's easy to explain to them the things that I explained today, what needs to be done to protect the trees. And uh, what I found is that, you know, you'll have some groups that will say, yeah, we have to save this tree, but they'll say, well, no, we can't change our plan or no, we, we, we don't wanna uh, control the contractor. Or you'll have a group that says, absolutely, let's change the plan, let's protect the trees this way. And then you have success. So it depends on where it's coming from. Thank you very much, all. And I would like to add something else, if possible. Um, I would like to thank the three uh, speakers. Uh, invite them if they can stay for a, a, a for a coffee break, an online coffee after this uh, meeting ends. And I think um, much big, very big thank you to the team, um, or the organizing team, which is uh, made up of Raluca Russo, uh, Andrei Kondoros, Rebecca Bedelan. Uh, Maria Serka, Diana Culescu, Teo Morar, Luciana Zeca, uh, Sonia, and so many other people who are behind the scenes and who are making this uh, happen.